Hello everyone, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our exploration of linear regression by focusing on two important applications or extensions of simple linear regression, in particular confidence intervals and prediction intervals, sometimes called confidence and prediction bands for linear regression. You can also construct confidence and prediction bands for nonlinear regression and multiple linear regression, which we may encounter in the future. But for now, let's just consider the simple regression scenario. So let's start off by going over a couple basics that we've already um, discussed up to this point. For example, uh, the simple linear regression model is y hat is equal to beta 1 hat x plus beta 0 hat, which is an approximation for the line beta 1 x plus beta 0. And keep in mind, from the assumptions of the simple linear regression model, um, the standard deviation of each of those uh, normally distributed random variables, which is usually represented by sigma, is equal to the error sum of squares divided by n minus 2, or the square root of the root mean square, or the square root of the mean square error term. Right? So these parameters, beta 1 hat and beta 0 hat, of course satisfy some properties. For example, the expected value of beta 1 hat is equal to beta 1, and the expected value of beta 0 hat is equal to beta 0. That is, they are unbiased estimators of these parameters. Since they are unbiased estimators, it's reasonable to consider the standard error associated to each of them. For example, the standard error for beta 1 hat is equal to sigma divided by the standard deviation of the control variable divided by m minus 2. And here we have the standard error for beta 0 hat is equal to sigma times the square root of 1 over n plus the square root of the average of the control variable divided by the variance of the control variable times n minus 1 on the bottom. Right. So what exactly do these standard errors allow us to do? Well, remember that each of them, assuming that we're sampling from a bivariate normal distribution, uh, we can have t critical values to measure our level of confidence, and then our critical values times the standard error terms gives us a margin of error for our confidence intervals, which are centered around our point estimates beta 1 hat and beta 0 hat, respectively. So one could say that these allow us, these allow us, to make inferences about each of our linear regression parameters individually. So one could ask, so individually, so one could ask if we can make inferences about both of them, i.e. the entire model in one go. So individually. So is it possible to test beta 1 hat and beta 0 hat at the same exact time? The answer is yes, and that is one of the questions that we're actually going to explore today. So before we get into that, let us just bring back our familiar picture for our linear regression model with one control variable and one response variable. So let's assume that this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. And let's assume that we choose a particular point, let's call this x star. Okay, so if our linear regression model assumptions are met, then there should be a normal distribution associated to this particular line. And of course, there's going to be some mean associated to that normal distribution, which we call the expected value of y given x is equal to x star. So this distribution, what if we actually don't exactly know what that distribution is, in particular its mean, and also its variance, right? So of course, if this is truly a linear regression model, then the mean should follow on our line of best fit, which is of course gonna be approximated by y hat is equal to beta one hat x plus beta zero. So take a guess at how we're going to estimate the mean of that green distribution. So let's ask this question a little bit more formally. So what, is a good estimate for the expected value of y given a particular value x is equal to x star. And you could of course write this as mu subscript y x is equal to x star. So what's a good estimate for that number? So at least from this picture you should be able to see 
that a reasonable point estimate will be y hat at x star. In particular, beta 1 hat x star multiplied together plus beta 0 hat. Okay, so keep in mind, beta 1 hat, this is a random variable because that depends on the sample that we haven't collected. Beta 0 hat, also a random variable. This number, x star, that's going to be just a number. And of course, that has to be a random variable as well. So take a guess at one of the first properties is that we need to prove in order to show that this y, this y hat x star is actually a good estimate for this parameter mu y given a particular value of x equals x star, right? So that is, we're trying to estimate the mean of these distributions with this particular number, y hat is equal to x star, which is the response or the predicted value associated to our linear regression model at x equals x star, All right? So we need to show that that is, of course, an unbiased estimator of that parameter mu sub y given x. So let's see if we can do that. So what is the expected value of y hat x star? So we're trying to show that this is equal to mu sub y given x. So what is y hat given x star? So that's going to be the expected value of the random variable beta 1 hat x star plus beta 0 hat. Keep in mind, this is the expected value of a sum, so we can distribute that over, and that's just a constant that can factor out. So that means this is just going to be equal to x star times the expected value of beta 1 hat plus beta 0 hat. So we've already proven that beta 1 hat is an unbiased estimator. Where'd my expected value go? Beta 1 hat is an expected uh, unbiased estimator of beta 1. So we have beta 1 x star. And the expected value of beta 0 hat we've already proven to be equal to beta 0. So what exactly is this? Well, this, remember, is y given x star for a particular value of our distribution. But there's actually something really special about this expression, because this is precisely equal to beta 1x plus beta 0 when x is equal to x star. If you remember from our assumptions for our linear regression model that the means are linear, that is the linearity assumption of our linear regression model, that is this is the expected value of y. And of course, that's under the assumption that x is equal to x star. That means this is going to be equal to the expected value of y given x is equal to x star. Or in shorter terms, mu y given x equals x star, which is what we're trying to prove. So we have shown that the expected value of y hat at x star is a good unbiased estimator of the mean of the distribution at that particular x star value. That is, it is an unbiased estimator of the mean. Now, just a quick note here about the representation of this y hat x star term. So just a quick note on that. Uh, y hat x star, which you already have defined as beta 1 hat x star plus beta 0 hat we can represent this in terms of the definition or the calculation of beta zero hat in terms of the average of y, average of x, and beta one hat. So you can write y hat x star instead as beta one hat x star plus y bar minus beta one hat x bar, right? And we can group those two terms together. So we can actually have another representation for y hat x star that is actually sometimes useful uh, for proving theorems about y hat x star. And that's going to be equal to y bar minus beta 1 hat times x star minus x bar. And again, I say that this can be sometimes useful for proving some theorems about y hat x star. And what is the one of the properties that this can actually be used for? Um, so one can show that using this little formula, that the variance of y hat x star, so what is that going to be? So that's just going to be the variance of that right-hand side. So you have to sort of talk about, you know, 
well, what exactly is this expression? So remember, y bar is a random variable such that the variance of y bar is equal to sigma y divided by the square root of n, right? x bar is a similar random variable. Beta 1 hat is a random variable whose variance is equal to some expression that you should already know. And x star, remember, is just a number, so you don't have to worry about that. So once you actually work through those calculations, you should find that that's actually equal to sigma squared, which is the variance of the y variable, times 1 over m plus x star minus x bar, the quantity squared, all over sx squared times n minus 1. So if we have the variance term, that means we have the standard error associated to this point estimate, and that is what? So the standard error for y hat at x star is going to be equal to this sigma, which is the root mean square error term, times the square root of 1 over m plus x bar, or let's do x star, minus x bar, the quantity squared, all divided by sx squared times n minus 1. Now, does this standard error look familiar? Well, it should. It's similar to the standard error term for beta 0 hat. So once we have the standard error, what kind of critical value will we use? So if we're assuming normality for everything, we will be using a t critical value with degrees of freedom and minus 2 because we're working with one uh, independent or uh, control variable. So if that is our t-critical value, then our margin of error is going to be equal to that t-critical value times our standard error of our point estimate. And that means our confidence interval for mu y given x under some level of confidence is going to be equal to our point estimate y hat x star minus epsilon and y hat x star plus epsilon. So that is the confidence interval for our mean, right? Now notice that x star is a variable in its own right, because if you choose a different x star value, you will have a different confidence interval, right? So this depends on a chosen x star value, right? So that's pretty interesting. So let's sort of look at you know, what this confidence interval looks like. So if we look at a graph of this, so let's assume that's x, let's assume that's y, and let's assume that this is our linear regression model, let's call that y hat, as you go to beta 1 hat x plus beta 0 hat. So one can show that if you, for example, do at x is equal to x bar, let's draw some dotted lines there, so we sort of see where it's at. So one can show that the confidence interval is, of course, going to be something like that. Let's actually draw these points a little bit more closer to the line, and you'll see why in just a moment. Right? So is our confidence interval at x is equal to x bar, because you can choose, of course, x star to be equal to x bar. That's no problem. But my claim is that this line actually isn't parallel, but it's actually curved actually curved. So it's not like our confidence intervals that were sort of like parallel to everything, but they're actually curved. And that's pretty interesting. So this upper curve is known as the upper confidence band. And this lower one, take a guess, is going to be called the lower confidence band. Now, why do these bands get wider and wider as you move across this interval? So let's take a look at the formula and sort of see what's going on there. So notice that this underneath the square root is a quadratic with respect to this variable x star. So remember this parabola, parabola x minus x bar squared is minimal at x is equal to x star or x star is equal to x bar. So it's pretty much looking like this, where that point is x bar, and this is the x star axis. So it gets bigger and bigger the farther you get away from x, x star equals x bar. So that's pretty much why this margin of error term 
is getting bigger as you move along that axis because remember t critical value is staying fixed here so that's why these confidence intervals are sort of getting wider so I'll of course leave it as a theoretical exercise to prove that epsilon is minimal at x star is equal to x bar so again, how do you interpret this confidence interval? So notice that we're analyzing both the slope and the intercept of this linear regression model, because remember y hat x star, this is what we're using as our point estimate, which includes both the slope and the vertical intercept at the same exact time. So if anything, what this interval is allowing us to do is to find a set of lines for which could be approximating our data. So one could say the following. So I am some percent level, you know, confidence that the true line lies in between these confidence bands. So I am, say, 95% confident that the true linear regression line is somewhere in between these two green curves. So that is what we call confidence bands for at least simple linear regression. So the next question that we're going to investigate is the following. Instead of making inferences about the mean of the distribution, is it possible to make inferences about a particular response value, y star, from a given control value, x star? That is, I don't really care about the mean of the distribution. I only care about the actual value within that distribution that I'm going to get for a particular control value, x star. Of course, I'm going to be increasing the amount of error for which I could, you know, I don't have control over. But that's, you know, the price that we take when we want a little bit more of a specific uh, value. Uh, from a hypothesis test, right? So let's see if we can construct maybe uh, a confidence interval or something for a particular value y star. So let's just again recall a few assumptions for our linear regression model. So by our assumptions, we know that y star should be normally distributed. That's guaranteed. We just don't know exactly what value it will take. The second property is this. The expected value of y star is going to be equal to what? You can maybe take a pause, pause, the, pause the video and sort of guess what this is. But that's just going to be equal to beta 1 hat x star plus beta 0. No hats on the betas, right? And of course, you could write this instead as mu y plus beta 1 times x star minus mu x. Right? So that's, of course, the same exact... Thing. So that's the expected value. And what is the variance of this random variable? So the variance of y star should be equal to sigma squared via the homocedasticity assumption of the linear regression model. And remember that that's equal to the error sum of squares divided by n minus 2. So these are the assumptions and its implications on this value for which we're trying to approximate. Right? So let's take a guess at a good estimate for y star. All right? So question, what is a good estimate for y star? All right? So usually if you have a distribution and you know an x value is located somewhere along this distribution, most of the time, the best place to start in terms of guessing is usually the mean of that distribution, okay? So what is the mean of this distribution? Well, the means are linearly distributed with respect to our linear regression parameters, beta 1 hat and beta 0 hat. So a reasonable assumption for that would be equal to y, y hat x star which again is beta 1 hat x star plus beta 0 hat. So it's the predicted value associated to the control variable for which we're inputting into our model, 
right? So again, the mean of that distribution, which we've already estimated via our confidence interval bands, confidence interval bands is a good estimate for any value along that distribution. Of course, there's error that is more associated to that approximation, but that's the price we get, okay? So if that is the case, well, what exactly do we want in regards to that point estimate? So what we would like is that this difference, D, which I'm going to define, Y star, the desired predicted value, and this point estimate, Y hat X star, we want this to be equal to zero, okay? So keep in mind, that's a random variable, that's a random variable, therefore that's a random variable too. So we would like this random variable to give us zero, ideally, right? So we would like the expected value of D to be equal to zero. Well, is that really the case? So let's see. So the expected value of the difference between our point estimate and our uh, desired value should be equal to zero. So let's see if it is. So that's the expected value of y star minus y hat x star. And that's going to be equal to the expected value of y star minus beta 1 hat x star minus beta 0 hat. Let's distribute our expected value over. Keep in mind x star is a number that can factor out. So that's going to be the expected value of y star minus x star expected value beta 1 hat minus expected value of beta 0 hat. So what do we know? So we know the expected value of y star. That's going to be equal to what? That's going to be beta 1 x star plus beta 0. And then we have minus x star. So expected value of beta 1 hat, that's going to be equal to beta 1. And then minus the expected value of beta 0 hat, that's going to be beta 0. So what do we have? So we have beta 0 minus beta 0 that cancels x star beta 1, x star beta 1 negative, that cancels, and that just leaves us with 0. So the expected value of the difference should be equal to 0, therefore 1 is a good point estimate of the other. So now that we have that, we should be able to construct a standard error representation for this as well. Now before we get into that, I just want to point something out because we have at least two different errors playing in part here. So notice for this difference, in particular y star minus y hat x star, we can write this instead as y star minus mu y given x equals x star, and then plus mu y x equals x star minus y hat is equal to x star. And why do I want to write it like this? Because we're using this mu as an approximation for y star, and we're also using y hat x star as an approximation for mu. So you sort of see where we have at least two different errors going on here, and why we, you know, probably will have a larger, say, confidence interval compared to our confidence interval for linear regression. That's pretty much what's going on here. So one can show, actually from this perspective, because we actually have standard errors um, for each of these three quasi four terms here, that the standard error for y hat x star is actually equal to sigma times the square root of one over m plus x star minus x bar squared divided by sx squared times m minus one. Well, why is my bracket so large, right? But there's one little difference. There will be a one plus in front of this one over m. So notice that it's almost the same as the confidence interval standard error, right? Except we have this one term here. And if you actually work through the proof of this via from this expression, you'll actually see where that one comes from algebraically. So again, uh, critical values will be a t critical value, again, with v is equal to n minus 2, in case you're interested in building a confidence interval. So our confidence interval under some level of confidence C for a predicted y value is going to be equal to y hat x star minus epsilon and then y hat x star plus epsilon. Notice the point estimate for these is exactly the same as the 
confidence interval, right? But this is not for the linear regression model. This is for a particular predicted value. Therefore, this is not a confidence interval. This is referred to as a prediction interval, a prediction interval. And how do you interpret this prediction interval? So I am, again, C percent confident, confident, that C percent of data points collected in the future, collected in the future, will be between these two points. I'm going to say points in quotes here because technically um, the distance actually changes depending on the x star value you use here, right? Because again, we have x star being a free variable in that uh, calculations. So let's draw our little picture again. Okay. So here's our linear regression model. So y hat. Let's look at our point x star because we know x x bar is a going to be a very important character in this story. So let's draw our confidence bands. So that's going to be our confidence bands. It should be smallest at x bar point. So let's make sure that graph at least looks sort of accurate. There we go. And of course, those should be symmetric about this line. I'm, I'm of course not drawing to scale here. Um, but this line definitely has to be minimal at that point. Right? So that is our confidence interval lower bound. That's my confidence interval upper bound. And now we're going to be drawing two other lines. So again, this is going to be like that. And also like that. Right? So this upper point, that is our prediction interval upper band, and that's our prediction interval lower band. Right? So some observational things is the first. Uh, prediction intervals are always wider than our confidence intervals. Assuming we're fixing our value of alpha. If you change your alpha, then of course, you know, if you're using different alphas for your CI and your PI, then you're of course going to get uh, conflicting observations. Now, is there anything special about these lines in blue and green? Actually, yes. And in, in terms of the graph, it might not look like this. But the following thing is true. That PIs and CIs are asymptotic to one another. So now what I want to do is introduce a couple metrics that are very useful in determining whether a bivariate or even a multivariate data point is an outlier associated to your confidence interval. Because if you sort of think about uh, how the linear regression model is working, let's assume that this is our data set, and let's assume that we have a point that's really far from the data set. Notice that the linear regression, although it should be something along those lines, will be weighted down by that particular point. In particular, it has what we call leverage over the linear regression parameters, um, and it's possible if it has that particular leverage, we might want to be removing that particular point, let's call it um, x, x sad face, um, so that it's not actually skewing our linear regression model. So let's just lay down a couple things um, before we get into that. Um, so I can just introduce you briefly uh, to these principles because they are definitely very useful in practice. So let's just recall that for our linear regression model y hat k, this is equal to beta 1 hat xk plus beta 0 hat. And also for a particular value or response by our data set yk, this can also be represented as beta 1 hat xk plus beta 0 hat plus our residual for that data point, epsilon k. And remember that these errors, or these residuals, satisfy the property that the sum from k is equal to n of our residuals is equal to zero. 
Now, let's also state a very important property. So one should note that these residuals are not necessarily independent, independent random variables potentially with the variance of these residual terms not equal to a constant variance, or if they are equal to a constant variance, they might not be equal to the variance of our distributions. And that can definitely be problematic, um, especially um, if those variances are really large or they change dramatically. Right? That's why sometimes people include that fourth property on top of, for example, normality, linearity, and homoscedasticity of those distributions. Sometimes they include this independent uh, constant variance error terms. Right? So now let us um, sort of represent our predicted values as a linear combination of our y values. And let's see if we can sort of grab those constants. Um, and maybe we can maybe determine if... Uh, those leverages have a nice representation, and maybe we can use those leverages to sort of actually determine the actual variance of these uh, residuals. So let's just notice the following things. So y hat k, remember, can be represented as y bar plus beta 1 hat times x bar minus, well, xk minus x bar, not x bar minus xk. So xk minus x bar. So if I rewrite y bar as 1 over n times the sum from j is equal to 1 to n of yj, and remember that beta 1 hat can be represented as a linear combination of the y values as well, and we proved that relationship earlier. That's actually equal to, again, the sum from j is equal to 1 to n. And do you remember what that was? So it was actually xj minus x bar all divided by sx squared and minus 1. So those were our cj's uh, from before. And we still have that xk minus x bar term hanging out on the right-hand side next to our beta 1 hat. And remember that the sum of each of those uh, cj's, oh, and there should be our yj term here, right? So let's not forget our yj term. Um, and that gives us our linear combination. Remember the sum of the cj's will be equal to 0, very easy proof as we proved before. So we can factor out that sum and write that as the sum from j is equal to 1 to m of 1 over n plus xj minus x bar xk minus x bar all over xk squared times m minus 1. And what are we going to do? Well, we're going to be factoring out that yj and that yj there outside on, let's put it on the right hand side. Let's call it yj there. So notice we have a bunch of constants in front of our yj terms that are dependent only on x. So what we're going to do is we're actually just going to call these the hjk terms because they are just constants that depend on both j and k indices. So what do we have? So that means we have y hat k is equal to the sum from j is equal to 1 to n of hjk times y. J. So it's a linear combination of the y values or the response values. So predicted linear combination of the response. So that's pretty interesting. Now there are some properties about these hj's which I'm not going to get into now, but one property that's not too difficult to prove is the sum from j is equal to 1 to m of hjk is actually going to be equal to 1. And that's going to be true for all k equals to 1, 2, all the way down to n. So I leave it for you as just an easy exercise, just to test your familiarity with all the little formulas that we've been working with. Now that we have this little constant, what we're actually going to do is define a particular subset of those constants, and we're going to be calling them lk. So lk is going to be defined to be equal to hkk which from this little formula from our hjk's, so j is going to be equal to k now, so the top is going to be equal to the same thing, so it's going to be xk minus x bar the quantity squared, uh, all divided by the bottom, and then the 1 over n term. So we're going to have 1 over n plus xk minus x bar the quantity squared, all over sx squared 
times m minus 1. Notice that this formula sort of looks like the interior of the square root for standard error for beta 0 hat, and also the predicted value of y hat x star, or y x star, right? Um, so there definitely is some relationships with these terms, and these terms is actually referred to as the leverage. Some people refer to it as the leverage score of xk. So the leverage of a particular control variable. Now leverages have a very important set of properties. So properties of leverages. And there's several applications of leverages that I'm definitely not going to get into now because we have uh, several other important things to discuss, but we can come to these later if we feel the need to. Uh, the first property is that the leverage k can be represented as leverage k squared plus the sum from k is equal to m of those constants hk, hjk squared terms, right? Now that on its own might not be useful, but you can use that property to prove the next very important property is that the leverage for any control point is always in between zero and one. And again, that's gonna be true for all, okay? Also, the sum from k is equal to one to n of all the leverages is gonna be equal to two and the average of all of our leverage values, so leverage one plus leverage two all the way out to leverage n all over m, this is actually gonna be equal to two over m. Now, these twos are only going to be the case for bivariate data, because this actually corresponds to the number of parameters in our model, in particular beta one and beta zero. So once we get to multiple linear regression, if we revisit leverages, those numbers are definitely going to be different. So definitely keep a eye out for that in the near future. And of course, one may ask, well, why introduce leverages now? So let's just sort of explore that question. So what is the purpose of leverages? So as I sort of mentioned before, leverages can help us determine if there are potential outliers in our data set. So outlier detection is definitely a starting point. So outlier detection, so what is a nice little rule to sort of determine whether it's an outlier or not? So if the leverage of a particular variable is greater than two times the average leverage, then xk is an outlier. So in particular, xk and its response variable, let's just call it xk, yk, since we're working with bivariate data sets. Now, a quick question here, or a quick note here, this 2 definitely is subjective. It doesn't have to be 2. It can technically be like 1.7, 1.6, or 0 0.9, or 3, or something like that. Um, it's sort of like the 1.5 and the 1.7 in the outlier detection interval that we previously discussed um, in a few videos ago. Um, so definitely this number is up for debate and it really depends on what type of data set you are working with. But if that is the case, then you might want to look at the scatter plot and see if that point is sort of, you know, sticking off from the general trends, or maybe it's if it's within our confidence and prediction bands, or if it's sort of on the boundaries or sort of beyond those, you know, definitely those are some things that you should consider. Now, although that is a useful application, this is the more important observation that you definitely should be aware of, is that the variance of our residual terms, our sample residual terms, is equal to sigma squared, if they have constant variances, but if they don't, one can prove that the variance of our residual is equal to that variance, times one minus the leverage of that point. And that's a very, very interesting observation and very, very useful, right? So if that is the variance of that random variable epsilon, then one can show that the standard error for epsilon k is of course gonna be equal to sigma times the square root of one minus our leverage term. And keep in mind, what is sigma? Well, sigma is gonna be equal to our square root of our error sum of squares divided by m minus two, which is again equal to the square root of our mean square error, the square root of it, which is of course gonna be approximated by s, the sample square root of the mean square error, right? So 
a couple other things that you definitely should observe about this formula and some interpretations about leverages, you know, do you want a large leverage close to one or do you want a leverage close to zero? So let's just pick a couple extreme values. So if the leverage of a point is equal to one, then the variance of our epsilon is equal to zero. So remember our residuals should be dancing around zero, right? They should be dancing around our linear regression line. So if our variance of our residuals is equal to zero, that means our points are extremely close to our linear regression line. That's a really good thing, assuming that the mean is equal to zero. Now, if the mean is not equal to zero and the variance is zero, that's a really bad thing, right? Now, as a consequence, one should also be able to prove as another formula, sort of as a corollary of this, is that the variance of our predicted value is actually equal to sigma squared times the leverage, not one minus leverage, but times the leverage, right? So again, if the leverage is equal to one, then the variance of our y hat case is equal to sigma squared. Was that a good thing? Well, that means that that should be equal to the variance of our response variable yk. And that means our predicted values and the true response variables um, have the same exact variance, and that's a, usually a very good thing, as long as the residuals have a variance that is really, really small, and our correlation coefficient, of course, should be close to one, with, you know, not many issue points hanging out in the end. Now, since we're looking at residuals, what if the variance is not constant? We usually look at residual plots to analyze, you know, several things about it. So, one fix to analyzing residuals that do not have constant variance is the following. And these are gonna be called standardized residuals. Standardized residuals. So one standardized residual is gonna be RK is equal to our residual divided by S. So what is S? So remember S is our square root of our error sum of squares. All right, this is the approximation to sigma, which we typically do not know. Now, this is only useful, this is only useful if the variance of epsilon is constant. In particular, it's equal to sigma squared. Now, if it's not constant, then this is practically useless. So you can call it whatever you want. Some people still do call that formula the standardized residual, um, but a more useful representation, if you believe that the variances might not be homocidastic, is RK is equal to epsilon K divided by S square root of one minus LK. And you're like, well, where does that formula come from? Well, remember that the standard error for epsilon K is equal to the standard deviation times the square root of one minus LK. And if you sort of note here what we have in terms of formulas, it's almost like a test statistic, right? So it's, remember, it's sort of like a test statistic. I'm not claiming it's a T stat or anything like that because that's not a discussion, but what would it look like? Well, it would look like, for example, the residual minus the claim value of the residual divided by the standard error of that residual. So that's obviously our standard error, that's our residual, and the claim value of our residual should be equal to zero. And what does the zero residual mean? That means our point is on the line. That's the goal for linear regression, is to have a very close model um, that models our data extremely well. So this representation is use useful for the general case. And it also has a lot of hints towards hypothesis testing on residuals, which is definitely an interesting conversation to be had. So I hope you enjoyed this exploration of residual analysis, uh, leverage scores, standardized residuals, and more importantly, confidence and prediction bands for the simple linear regression model. We're definitely going to revisit these topics once we hit multiple linear regression, but until then, take care.